Welcome to Make Things That Matter, the podcast where we explore impactful products and the cultures that create them. I'm your host, Andrew Scottsko, and if I'm doing my job well, each episode of this show will help you to do meaningful work, make things that make things better, and have a great experience doing it. C. Todd Lombardo is a data and design-obsessed product leader, currently the VP of Product and Design and Machine Metrics. He's a mentor at Techstars, a global speaker and consultant on all things product design and customer experience, and is also on the faculty at Madrid's IE Business School and Baltimore's Maryland Institute College of Art, where he teaches graduate level courses in design, innovation, and data visualization. And, you know, because he's obviously bored and looking for more interesting things to do, C. Todd has also co authored three books published by O'Reilly, with his most recent book being Product Research Rules, which also happens to be one of my new favorite guides to thinking about product research. I can also give a big shout out to his last book, Product Roadmaps Relaunched, which totally saved my sanity last time I went through a big product planning process. Now, this is a fun conversation that really explores how to think about the questions that we are all asking, often unconsciously, that shape our lives and our work. Talking with C. Todd has made me a better listener, a better thinker, and hopefully a better question asker, and I hope it'll do the same for you. Please enjoy C. Todd Lombardo. C. Todd, welcome to the show. How are we doing today? Pretty well. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So right before we hit record, we had just started jamming on something that I think is going to be pretty relevant to a lot of folks, which is just to timestamp this for everybody. We're recording this in December 2020. It's been a bit of a dumpster fire of a year on all sorts of fronts. You know, big thing for everybody is that this whole, you know, this work from home thing. This is going to be this is going to be a thing not for and, you know, there's no put this genie back in the bottle, I think. But we were just talking about this and you were starting to share with me a little bit about how it's changing things for you as a product leader. Yeah. So I was just talking about how I just got a standing desk and I have to assemble it this weekend. Which one did you get, by the way? I got the um, Jarvis at Fully. I really liked their Mm. approach because you could kind of pick and choose what you wanted. And they had all sorts of accessories. And, you know, 1100 bucks later, I have this, you know, whole monstrosity of thing to assemble. But I'm very excited about it for a number of reasons, because I didn't have a good work from home setup. Um, Mm. I... You know, sure, I have this tiny little desk. Literally, what I'm sitting at is maybe about 22 inches wide. It's small. Mm. It's not spacious. I have very little room to put a notebook and draw. Uh, and so as somebody who is a more design-minded uh, product person, oftentimes when I'm leading a meeting, I'm I'm the one drawing on the whiteboard. Right? And I have that mm-hmm. reputation uh, all over the place. And you yeah. might see sketch notes for me somewhere online. Um, so I'm usually the person yeah. drawing on the whiteboard and try to sketch out and visualize the conversation as it's going it's a lot harder to do that when you're just at Mm. home by yourself. And yes, there are tools, they're great tools like Miro and and Miro. And um, there's another one I just learned of recently. Um, Whimsical. Whimsical uh, is another one that's very similar. Yeah. Um, So those are three great tools. They all do very similar, slightly different things. Um, But you don't necessarily use them for every single meeting. Whereas if in the office you have a, you know, whiteboard in almost every conference room and somebody can get up Mm -hmm. and draw. And that person's usually me. (laughs) So that has been (laughs) a challenge for me. And I've even, you know, I've been frustrated about it and I haven't been able to articulate it. And I was on a walk with my wife uh, a couple weekends ago, just walking the dog around town. And um, we were both just the conversation around our work environments and um, uh, 2020 and, and everything. And she's a surgeon, by the way, just to give you a sense, her work environment is still relatively similar, but Hmm. different. Um, but there's, there's a lot more, uh, not like her surgery itself is probably pretty similar. Maybe they, they wear a N95 mask instead of, uh, the other surgical masks they'd use, but it's all the stuff leading up to the actual surgery and, and, um, in the office and how things are different from an office visit. And, And she does televisits now too. So we were just talking about that. And I was talking about like, yeah, I've got this small desk at home. I don't have a, an even you know, larger desk that I had in the office. It's, I can't really stand up and uh, there's no whiteboard and all sorts of things. And so I started to, to try and think about what can I do to make that better? I was like, well, I can probably at the very least just get myself a better desk um, and start to work on making the environment a little better. Um, but then also like, you know, I've been a little bit frustrated, like, okay, I feel like I'm a little stifled as a product leader because there's a level of creativity and thinking i think visually i think in pictures so the 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 inability to get get up when i'm in a meeting and just draw something out and say do you mean like this and draw some boxes and Mm. arrows and i'm literally meaning like boxes and arrows is all you need to do yeah real simple yeah um and that's kind of off you know a little bit off the the board uh, off the off the board literally and um i don't have like my space here is very constrained on my desk so it's not even like mm-hmm. i have enough room to throw a notebook down and be like let me see let me sketch this out for you right now 
Um, yeah. So it just, it, that had got me thinking like, wow, I feel like I'm, you know, I've got to find a way to help start solving for this a little bit as a product person so I can help not only bring my team together, but also you know, maybe conceptually drive them um, and, and help them visualize some things. Because a lot of times I'm, I found it, especially this year, I'm a lot more verbal in my, in my communication. Mm. And we know that yeah. verbal communi- like communication, there's a huge amount that's nonverbal of your body language and yep. tone of voice and everything, but also there's a level of visual and that. And I think that part is missing uh, this mm-hmm. year is in our, and at least for me in product leadership. Yeah, so here's a, here's a related question just cause we're on the topic of like, how do you lead teams and, and so forth in, in a, in a totally different environment. The thing I'm finding I miss the most is like the walk arounds, you yeah. know, where you, you, I'd walk around and just, Hey, what's up? How's it going? And, and that would inevitably lead to something interesting sometimes, or, you know, there's the water cooler conversations mm-hmm. that would yield some great insight. And I'm curious if you've seen anything to try to replicate that or at least get some of the benefits of it, even if the way it happens is different. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've always had this at, um, at machine metrics and it's called the dev cafe. And so, uh, it was really initially started by the developers and they would just, I think when they first started, it was like every day at like 1140, um, they would just jump all, all jump on a call. Or, uh, I think when everyone was in the same office, just hop on and just be like, Hey, what's up? Uh, anyone want to talk about anything? And it was daily for a long time. Uh, and then when we got two offices, we had Boston and Northampton, uh, there's clearly like, it had to be done over, over zoom and every day was felt like too much. Um, so then we just limited it to Monday and Thursday and it actually works out well. It's still, still going. Um, so I'm going to kind of hop on around 1140 or at 1140 hop on and kind of talk about whatever, like sometimes there's an agenda. Sometimes there isn't. Sometimes somebody yeah. throws in Slack, like, Oh, Hey, I want to talk about this thing. And, um, so it, it is mostly for the product organization and, uh, like marketing and sales really don't really show up to it. Um, I don't even know if they're officially invited, but that's sort of the, just one example of that kind of water cooler esque type of banter, um, where you can kind of just almost a walk around, um, type of scenario. It's like, Oh yeah, it's not quite as random. There is, it is scheduled. Um, but it does, does happen. I think Slack does allow for the, you know, quick, Hey, I want to talk to you about blank. Um, but it's still, mm-hmm. it's, it still can get that quick access, which a lot of walk arounds can like, Oh, Hey, remind me. Um, but that also comes with a downside of like, you can do that at any time of day, at any time of night when somebody's in a meeting or not. Uh, and that's going to be uh, antithetical to, to good product, like productivity. Like somebody could just be like trying to solve yeah. a problem and suddenly like Slack, ding, 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 ding. Like, you know, you put your phone in airplane mode. I put mine in airplane mode. It's like, yeah, let's, let's put those distractions aside. We need to have a conversation. Um, yeah. So actually I have an idea that might help for this. So one of the things I'm very into in, in my life that helps me a lot and has been major help for me during the, the craziness of, of 2020 has been, um, a, a meditation practice. Mm-hmm. So that's something I've gotten, I had one for a couple of years, but have really leaned on it this year. And I'm in a, um, one of the meditation groups I participate in has now, you know, basically moved fully online as you would expect. And we have like a Slack channel for it and everything. Mm-hmm. And there's a thing that people are doing in that group that actually might work for this. It just occurred to <clears> me, <throat> which is, um, people in meditation groups, they like to sit and meditate together. Mm-hmm. And it's a little bit like this where it's like, how do you have that serendipitous thing? And so what, pe- what people started doing is we have this just like, it's always on meeting room basically. And anytime you want to go sit, like you, you can just pop into it. And so what people will do is they'll just say like, Hey, I'm going to go sit in 10 minutes for half an hour. And anyone who wants to join just pops in then. And so they just kind of like broadcast it out. And so it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's not scheduled, but it, you kind of have that. It's almost like, Hey, I'm getting coffee in 10 minutes. You want to go? It's like, a, it's kind of like that. Um, mm. And so I don't know, it might, might be a thing that could work, but it's, I've seen it yield some fun serendipity in that group. Yeah. There's a, the team out in Northampton, Mass. Um, they used to go for, um, they called it Familiars at Four. Familiars is a, is a local coffee shop that was just around the okay. corner from the office there. And so they used to go there at four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and uh, what the, what the team still did, why well, I didn't realize this, um, but they would still like get together at four o'clock and be like, Hey, you know, familiars at four, they would actually just kind of get together and just, just like hang out on Slack and have a yeah. banter. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, that, um, was another thing. It was less scheduled. It was still scheduled, but it was like daily. And it was again, you know, just show up and hang out and talk about whatever, like literally just grab a coffee. And then we also have, um, Thursdays at four 30, we do a, like, Hey, anyone wants to just crack a beer and do a happy hour, come hang out and chat, you know, like, 
shoot, shoot the shit, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, grab yep. a beer, talk about whatever yep. you want to talk about. Um, yep. yeah, for sure. So those, those are a couple of things that we've sure. tried to do to, to try to keep some of those randomness and some, you know, the, the not so everything scheduled. Um, the other thing that we're trying that we've just started to think about, um, cause we're a bunch of us, like we're three or four of us. We're doing, um, uh, let me back up this week. I've told you off, off the recording, but, uh, this week my team has been working on OKRs for the next year. And in that conversation, we've had some subgroups and this one subgroup I was in, uh, myself, my CTO and my director of HR, we were talking about meetings and always being on zoom. And so we thought that one of the things we're going to invite the team to consider is let's just mark a meeting as a walk and talk. So no zoom, right. Audio only. Mm, you don't need nice. to be in front of a computer because so much of us, so many times we feel like I have to be sitting down in front of a computer on a meeting to be on screen. And I think, cause that misses, we miss that. Like the familiars at four, like you actually walk and talk. And it's amazing when you're actually mm -hmm. walking and moving and how your brain might move a little bit differently and think a little bit differently when you're, when you're in motion. So um, we're, we're basically going to propose like a, Hey, why don't we just add that as an option in our, our calendars? Like, Oh, this can be a walk and talk meeting. So it means no screen, no, like just audio only yeah. walk around, you know, go, do, do something active while you're, while you're talking and don't feel like you have to be in front of a, a TV or a TV, uh, a screen. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I've started doing it <clears throat> before the pandemic. I noticed that I was, I wanted more video meetings with people. Right. And now I want the opposite because before the pandemic, it'd be like, oh, cool. I would always be on a call with somebody and it was such an inferior experience. And then I wanted a video meeting and now it's, it's flipped because now I'm on too many video meetings. And so now I've started dialing in just on phone to like every possible thing I can. Right. If I like, if I have any one on one call with somebody, not, not any, but like at least half of them, I'm not showing up on video. I'm just calling in and I'm out for like a walk in the neighborhood somewhere. Yeah, it's great. And uh, I, I will say it totally works. Yeah. Totally works. Well, let's, let's sort of pivot into yeah. some of the main things we were going to talk about today. Because, you, you know, it's funny, you were just mentioning OKRs. And it, I think it's that time of year. It feels like everybody I've talked to lately, right, is, is where everyone's in that product planning cycle. Yeah. Everyone's thinking like, okay, 2020 is thankfully just about done. <laughs> what are we going to do next year? We're going to talk a lot in this conversation about your new book, Product Research Rules, and, and about interviewing and things like that. But I, I actually, you know, you and I first got connected because your last book, uh, Product Roadmaps Relaunched, like, basically came it was my white night when i was losing my mind <laughs> to the to the uh to the world of to the insanity of road mapping and it just you know i feel like this is this is a this is everybody's in that insanity right now and mm. i thought it might be worth spending a few a few minutes at least talking yeah. about that and, and kind of because you know it's been a couple of years since that book came yeah. out how your thinking has evolved about that so you know if you were going to give somebody today like hey here's what how I would recommend you do this, right? Whether it's, you think about integrating like OKRs and roadmaps and should we have roadmaps? There's always that question. Mm -hmm. um, how are you thinking about that stuff today? Yeah, great question. Um, my thinking definitely has evolved. I think the overall principles we wrote about in the book are still very sound. Maybe the way we explain them and uh, some of the, the more nuances around them probably have evolved since. Um, but but overall, it's... um. It, setting goals, right? Goal setting is still important, regardless of, of the, your industry, uh, your position in the company, et cetera. It's good to set goals. I think that's just a human thing. And then how do you know you reach that goal? Like that's where OKRs are, right? And it's funny, I was trying to explain OKRs to my wife. She's like, why do you call them OKRs? Why don't you just call them goals? She's like, just, you know, it's <laughs> a goal. Sure. Like, and that's how you reach it. That's great. I was like, that's just the, the acronym. And I was like, never mind. <laughs> um, you know, like you started to tell the history of like HP. Like, never, never mind. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like exactly. She doesn't care. <laughs> right. Yeah. She's like, well, uh, yeah. Anyways, I was like, look, you have a patient. You want to have that patient. You know, the outcome is the you know successful surgery. Or the surgery is the activity you did, but the outcome is the health of the patient. I was trying to explain all that. And how do you measure the the outcome, uh, the the health of that patient? That kind of thing. Uh, but it was fun. And um, but I think that you know, goal setting, whether you use OKRs or something else, right? Setting goals is important. Uh, looking towards the future, planning out the act of planning is incredibly valuable, uh, even if the plan itself is not directly followed. Uh, and I think that's one of the other things that I don't know if we, you know, nail that point home in the book, but that's what road mapping is ultimately trying to get you to do is to think about where you're going in the future. And uh, even if you may not go exactly there, the fact that you've come together and brought your team together uh, and 
facilitated conversations so that you're in agreement and alignment of this is the direction we're going in. Um, great. That may, that may change. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, but that's ultimately, I think the thing that's really important is setting a goal and having a direction are two of the, the big things. And then the mm-hmm. nuances to get there, like, yeah, separate your, your release plan and your roadmap. And that's a lot of people, um, you know, from my experience and from others, like that was the epiphany of a lot of people like, Oh my God, like I'm trying to mash these two of the same documents together and to be one thing and actually I should separate them. And that's going to help out a lot. Um, you know, that's also very, very important. Uh, I think because the roadmap can be much more strategic in nature and much more thematic as where you're going. And, and if I think about it this way, it's like, if your roadmap is that strategic direction setting, here's where we're going. The release plan is like your turn by turn directions, right? If I'm driving to you from, from here in the Boston area, uh, I might have turn by turn directions that might get me out of Massachusetts into New York, but I'm probably not going to have turn by turn directions that get me through Texas and all the way into, you know, maybe through Vegas and into Southern California. I might not have those right now because I may go a different way. I may mm-hmm. drive to San Francisco first and then go down, right? I, I'm not exactly sure. I know I'm going West uh, in, in an overall direction, but my turn by turn directions aren't going to be that granular that far out, but they are going to be pretty granular probably for me to get me out of Massachusetts and maybe in, in through to New York or something. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. so that's kind of how I think the metaphor plays really well is that release plan is your turn by turn directions that are short term. Uh, but your roadmaps kind of giving you that more longer term, uh, direction. Yeah. You know, I think when I first read your book, I think I had a confusion that maybe a lot of people who have read a lot of the things in the product space may also share, which is, you know, there's, there's a lot of voices in the product space, some of which are very, very vocal that we shouldn't do uh, roadmaps at all. We should rather just just do OKRs and have a have a product vision, for example. Marty Kagan, he's one of the folks who advocates strongly in that direction. But as I've sat with sort of both both sets of material, and you know, I, I just actually had Marty on the show recently, and it, it occurred to me that we were kind of everyone was actually saying the same thing, just yeah. using different language. Yeah, I think right? like I think Marty's right. approach to a roadmap is the older, like more Gantt chart release plan, like like his mind goes to there with the roadmap. He, he thinks, I, I think, and I've had a couple of conversations with him. I had dinner with him in London at one of the mind, the products I, and we even approached him to, to talk about it. And, and he was like, Oh, I don't want to do anything with roadmaps. But I, as you start to unpack what he's saying, he's basically thinking a roadmap is a longer term release plan. Like that was sort mm-hmm. of his mo- mental model of it. And I was like, Oh, okay, great. Then we're actually pretty aligned in what we're talking about. We're just using slightly yeah. different words. The way I interpret, like the way I've sort of pushed the smash those together in my mind is that, you know, if you sit with a lot of Marty stuff, um, you know, he talks a lot, especially recently, which I'm very glad about, about product strategy. Yes. Right. And, and he first defined that a few years back, he talked about it as like, oh, what's the sequence of product market fits? Now he's sort of talking about it a little bit more abstractly in terms of, you know, basically what is the set of problems we need to solve and in what order? And it's like, oh, when you think about it that way, you're saying the same thing, yep. like a roadmap in your language is just a, a representation of that. And yep. so I was like, oh, okay, they're, they're pretty, pretty much on the same yeah. page here, just different words. Yep. No, I, I completely agree. And it's, it's funny because we realized that we had to decouple those things because everyone was thinking, oh, a roadmap is these two things together and it shouldn't be. So it echoes what I've heard from many people and experienced myself, which was you kind of end up at that truth that I think it's the famous Eisenhower quote where he says, what plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Something yes. like that, right? Where it's like, yeah, the, the problem is only when we we stay attached to our plan, mm-hmm. right? But the fact that we planned together, hopefully, that was actually really great because uh, now we have a shared context and all of those things. I actually have a specific question for you that came from an audience member. So thinking about roadmaps, by now, anybody who's paying any attention in the product space has had it well drilled into our, their head that you know, focus on outcomes, focus on problems to solve, right? Marty's big about this with his new book, Empowered, right? We know it's an empowered team when they're given problems to solve, not solutions to build. That makes sense conceptually. Where I and others are finding it a bit tricky uh, to put into practice is kind of the, I'm going to say like the level, the altitude or the granularity where it moves from one to the other. And so the question is, you know, if you think about a road mapping process that is more strategic, kind of at what level does something move from being this strategic problem we've got to solve to being a quote unquote solution? Like how well defined does something have to be mm-hmm. for it to click over from the former to the latter? Does that question make sense? Yeah, yeah. You're kind of asking like what, like what altitude, how 
granularing to be about the problem I need to solve. And um, it's going to vary based on, I guess, what your position is, how big your company is, um, and where maybe, are you let at? Let me ground this? it in an example. Maybe yeah. that'll be, maybe that'll make it more obvious. So I, I went through a road mapping exercise recently, and uh, obviously I have to fuzz out most of the details here, but we were designing the future of a system, right? We just said, okay, we see this future in about two years. About two years out, we believe we can get to this future. And along the way to that, we can see these high level things that they, they have to exist for this future to exist, right? Like you, you can't do this future unless you have these, these big building blocks, basically. Uh, and, and along the way, so those building blocks obviously represent big pieces of the challenge that have to be solved, but they tend to be framed as like you need, we were designing command and control for an autonomous system. Um, and we were looking at all the different things that have to be involved. And so my question is, I started to wonder about, are we getting too prescriptive with this, right? And so is it, is it, are we actually disempowering the team if we say, hey, in this quarter, we believe we need to solve like this planning problem? or this part of the planning piece of the whole solution. Is that still a quote unquote problem or have we crossed over now into solution territory and are, are we disempowering the team? So you've identified that the planning was the, 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 the struggle to plan was the problem. Like what was the problem that you had defined? It was around plan. Maybe I'm getting too, too into the details. Um, but it sounded like the, the, the problem was around, Oh, that the users struggle with planning this out. And so we need to figure out how to solve that because is it, is it caused? Did it cause friction elsewhere? Did it cause friction in their in, in the rest of the the user's life or job or, or use outside of the product? Um, and if so, okay, this is going to add a lot of user value. Um, there's probably a lot of ways you could solve for that planning, um, and that's where you get okay. We know we need to focus on this planning element. I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do it, but we need to figure out a better way to to allow for planning. Um, that's where yeah. you could have like I've clearly defined and framed the problem. I'm going to get the hell out of the way and let the team deter, uh, figure out what the solution is. I, I have another example um, that I can talk about from machine metrics. Um, this was kind of fun to see because it was a great. It was one of the one of the first examples since, since I arrived at machine metrics was how the team came and I and I've been sort of doing the same thing with my PM at the time. Like, see if you can just frame the problem and you know step back and not tell them exactly how to how to do it or how to how to uh, implement it. And uh, so my product manager at the time said, okay, we need a, a better way for machinists who are running these, these machines on the factory floor to see how they're tracking on their day. So um, on a factory mm -hmm. floor, a machinist might have like, here's an order. You got to make a hundred parts uh, uh, of part A and then maybe 200 parts of part B. Um, and so when they're running that, that uh, part A and they're in that uh, uh, tracking onto that hundred parts, it's like, what does that look like? And so we kind of have some, some metrics around that and some visualizations. Um, mm -hmm. But like you have made so far, you've made 56 parts. You should have made, you know, um, 58 parts. So you're a couple parts behind. What does that mean? And so we could just throw up some numbers. That was one of the things that we were trying to do. But then we thought about like, well, you know, the machinist isn't always staring at the screen. So we can make the numbers yeah. larger, but maybe we should figure out a way to visualize this. So um, one of our front end developers saw the, um, the burnout chart in Jira. And he's like, well, wait a minute. He's like, basically the, the, the simple line, the dotted line is like what you should have made. Like, you know, you roughly, every mm -hmm. part takes a certain amount of time to make. Um, that's roughly, we're going to put that slope of the line based on what the, the cycle time of the part is, how much it takes, how long it takes to make a part. And he's like, and then the step one, like we can increment every time uh, we get the, from the machine that says, Hey, you've made a part. Once we get that data point from the machine, we can just increment that. And so you kind of have this like stepwise up. And so does how far up or down are you from that mm -hmm. standard line? Um, does it see? So we kind of tried to replicate a similar thing to what Jira has for their burnup chart into our product. And um, it was one of those things that like, oh my God, like it totally solved the problem. But we didn't, you know, the PM didn't say build a new, build a new chart. He was just like, yeah. yeah, we're trying to figure out a better way to do this. So it was actually the designer, it was actually the front end developer's initial idea. And they worked with the designer to, to figure out exactly how to, how to implement it. But um, good example of here's the problem. They're not like, we have some numbers on the screen, but those numbers aren't solving the problem. Uh, we got to find a better yeah. way to visualize this. <clears throat> what can, what can we do? Um, that's one probably more at the, like, here's a product theme area around visualization and here's a more feature like specific feature level there may be something even higher than that right um oh mm -hmm. hey um 
like, let's just take the manufacturing operators for a second. Like, you know, operators are struggling to do their job right now. Like our, our tablet interface, our, our you know, mobile app, or no, not a mobile app, but it's all a tablet interface is designed to make them a better operator. So like empower one operator to the work of three. Uh, effectively is what mm-hmm. the intent is for it. So are yep. we providing them with the right pieces of information on that tablet interface to let them, you know, do that? And obviously, they're not going to be staring at it uh, every single second of the day. They're going to be looking at lots of other things. They're going to be looking up like, all right, it's 20 feet away. Do I have a quick visual that tells me what's going on? I don't have to worry about that. I can focus somewhere else, right? And so that's a much mm-hmm. higher level problem to solve. And there's a whole bunch of features that could actually go and solve that problem. Right. So I think it yeah. depends on the level of what you're trying to solve and how broad it is when you start just to go back, circle back to your earlier question of like, when does it become a problem to solve? When does it become a feature? How do you actually frame it? Um, so does that start to help put into context of? Yeah, absolutely. But it occurs to me that we're really talking about problem framing, which is one of these to me, like subtle arts, right? It's, it's very simple to understand at the surface, but when you get into it, it's quite challenging, I find. How do you actually coach people on problem framing? Like, how do we know when we've got a good frame versus a not helpful frame? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think um, one of the things, and I think Aris did a good job outlining this kind of in a book of like, you got a hunch around mm-hmm. something and I've got a hunch that something is off. And how do I go from that mm-hmm. hunch to something that's a little more crystallized, right? And so what I, what I think about is, does... You know, you've got a hunch on something like what's the what's the piece of information? What what do you perceive is incorrect about a scenario or a situation? And can that help you think through a little more about what the problem is? And so a lot of it and some a lot of it sometimes is like getting into that, you know, simple five whys, right? But maybe it isn't just why, it's like the who, what, when, where, how, right? So it's the five W's mm-hmm. uh, plus H. Um, and just looking at a problem and be like, or looking at a scenario and saying, what's different about it? what's wrong about this? How do we think about this? How are we thinking about it today? Mm. How do we map out our assumptions? Um, and so it's, uh, I've talked about this in, um, in other areas too. I, mean, I think we mentioned a little bit in the, in the, the research rules book is like, uh, I learned this from a, a guy here in Massachusetts called Dan Rothstein. It's, it's called the right question Institute and the sort mm. of the right question. The QFT. Yeah. Yeah. Question formulation technique. And it was actually invented for like a, elementary school kids. And if you could teach kids to ask better questions, they learn better. So it was total educational environment mm-hmm. that it was brought in, but it applies to all of our life. And of course, to a product person, because you as a product leader are like, what are the questions I need answers to, right? What are the, what are the ways to think about things? Cause if you have the, all the answers, you probably don't have a, a you don't need a team, right? If, if everything's answered, something's wrong, <laughs> Right. You, you should, yeah, what, are we, a, what are we doing? What here? are we doing? Right. <laughs> exactly. There's a question. <laughs> yep. um, so I think that's part of it is, is coaching them to think through what are the right questions I should be asking? Are they open-ended questions? If I'm asking a closed ended question, should I flip it to an open? If I'm asking an open ended question, what happens if I flip it to a close? Does that change what my, what, what I learned about the scenario? Um, so that's one way to, to think about how to. Could you walk me through an example of using the question formulation technique? Sure. What was the um, the planning sure. example you talked about? You want to use that as an example? So what we were trying to do is this is a tool very similar to what you were saying to help empower machinists to be able to do more work, basically, and have one be able to do the work of three. Yep. Same idea, but with farm operators. Um, how do we sort of automate things and help give them leverage effectively um, and so you're starting to weave in automation technology to help farmers get more done basically and run a, run a more efficient farm. And the, the planning problem was saying part of this is going to be involved, like the automation of certain processes that um, a farmer would have manually done themselves, but now they hopefully don't have to. And the, the planning piece was saying, okay, there, there needs to be a plan that in the automated system will be following. Right. And so th- there's this whole question of how do you design that plan uh, how do you how do you design the plan so that it's you know efficient and safe and makes sense? And there, there's all these like um, kind of latent forms of understanding that that a farmer or a farm a person working on a farm has that they just implicitly do when they do it themselves. But how do you translate that into something that a machine could do, basically? Mm-hmm. Okay, so does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So from a QFT perspective, one of the things to do is what are the questions that you could think about. Uh, about this farmer? What are the questions that you have about them? What questions do they have about their day and their job? 
And so if you started to write down all whatever questions, sort of like a question storm, like brainstorming, but for questions, right? Mm -hmm. Write down mm -hmm. a bunch of questions. So maybe give me like two or three questions you might have about the farmer, their job or their scenario. Sure. This is great. I love real examples. A couple of questions are basically, when does a farmer decide to go off plan, right? They go into a field with a, with a plan in mind, but it's very common that they basically deviate on the fly and they'll say, oh, I'm going to change here. So one question is like, well, when, when does that happen and why? Uh, another one is uh, they talk a lot about efficiency. Uh, and there, I know there's a lot of things that they are looking at in real time that have that kind of tell them, am I running efficiently right now? Is this machine operating efficiently? Am I on, like, am I on pace in the way I want to be? Uh, I don't think we have a good enough understanding of what those, what, basically what those inputs to their decision process are. Okay. So let's, let's say I've got three questions that I, I wrote down. First question I, you has said was, when does a farmer decide to go off the plan? Second mm -hmm. question was, why do they decide to go off plan? Third question was, from the farmer's perspective, am I running efficiently? What mm -hmm. is it about those, those three questions? You got two, first two are open-ended questions. Uh, mm -hmm. When, when, why? Although when can uh, oftentimes is a semi-closed question, right? There's usually very discrete answers, right? Why is much more mm -hmm. open, broad, open-ended. Yep. Uh, third question is yes or no. Am I running efficiently? Yes or no. So I would challenge you say like from a QFT perspective. So, okay. Um, or maybe I would rephrase, rephrase the third one. I'd say, okay, what, how do I know when I'm running efficiently? Right. So th that's my next challenge is let's flip them both. Let's flip them either direction. So when does a farmer decide to go off plan? How would you change that to an even more closed question? It's kind of open. So how would you change it to a, a more closed question or how would you change it to a more open question? Um, more open would be something like, uh, what has a farmer changed the plan? Or why does a, where, that was the first one, wasn't it? Why, why does a farmer change the plan? That was the second one, yeah. Uh, I already, yep. That was the second one? Mm -hmm. um, mm, I'm struggling with this one. Uh, this is harder than I thought. Um, I'll give you a, little, I'll give you a little, little, little nudge. Does a farmer go off plan frequently? So again, it's closing the question, right? Do they go off plan frequently? Mm. I don't tell you when. I just say, do they go off plan frequently or, or mm. really okay. often? I get it. Right? So again, it's trying to just close the question because it was the question initially was when. So it's around frequency um, or a time mm -hmm. base. So you could close the question by, by okay. saying, do they go off frequently? All right. Now let's take the second question. Why do they decide to do this? How would you close or reframe that question? You could think about uh, a couple of different things uh, there, but like, how would you close that question? And, and not necessarily you're going yeah. to specifically go with the close, but the fact that you have to think through, how do I turn this open-ended question into a close-ended question? Yeah, no, it's breaking my brain a little bit. This is great. Uh, this is a really useful exercise and I want to practice with this more. Um, I'm, I'm, never, I'm not used to closing a question down. Uh, so why does farmer go off plan? Um, I would say something like, why does a farmer, well, why is still pretty open? I was going to say, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to keep it still in the domain of like causes. So I could say, what causes a farmer to change course? Yeah. Yeah, you could start to get to a what, so it starts to get to maybe a, a slightly more limited set of questions. Um, and I would, I would look at it as thinking like, does it help the farmer if they go off plan? Right. So hmm. if they go off plan, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Mm. right is it good or bad okay. if they go off plan yes there was a plan like we just talked about plans and roadmaps and we know that sometimes going off plan is a good thing the fact that we have a plan yes. is good the, the fact that we, we may not have to stick to it sometimes sticking to it's bad um so maybe the yes. same thing applies yes. to a farmer right um and the last question was all right close question am i running efficiently how would you open that up i was going to say what what are the important indicators that a farmer looks at in their operation that's a little bit still, still kind of closed, but it's a little bit more yep. open. Yeah. Still, um, still pretty open question. I'd say. Um, yeah. Yep. That could what I'm getting at is that a farmer, an experienced farmer or an operator can quickly look at, you know, a dashboard or a set of metrics and have a vi instantly have a sense of how well this is going. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand that model. Yeah. Basically I don't understand the model in their head. Yeah. I would, I phrase the question is how does a farmer know they're running efficiently? Or not. Mm, yep. Right. So that's sort of how I would open yeah, up that exactly. question. Right. So now we've gone through this exercise, just taking these three questions and trying to think about them in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. So using, you know, Dan in, uh, uh, in their QFT method is like, okay, you know, um, now that we've opened or closed them, 
which questions do we actually want to try and answer? Which ones are mm-hmm. going to help us achieve our initial goal of helping this farmer plan better? If we answer certain questions, we may get we may get us further along to reaching our goal. So that's kind of how you can use QFT to think through a, uh, an area and try to frame your problem space a little bit better. So nice. That kind of helps nice. exemplify yeah. the situation, but I'll right, tell you good. how uh, thinking. Yeah, yeah, thank uh, you. yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm I glad I broke your I brain. Have, <laughs> you did. You broke my brain a little bit. It's, I try to break my brain at least weekly, hopefully more than that. Yeah, I love I love it. Thank you. Because uh, the question I find that I struggle with is, and that uh, that teams, some of the people on my, the teams I work with struggle with, is knowing when it's framed enough, mm-hmm. basically, right? Where there, because you can go infinitely down the rabbit hole yep. of like generating questions. And you know, one thing I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about is sort of the distinction between uh, research questions and interview questions. Uh-huh. That's something that I think a lot of people uh, they, it's easily missed. Yep. Yep, for sure. Um, but in this scenario, like, yeah, you can go down the rabbit hole. And then sometimes you might notice that some of your questions are actually very solution focused questions. They're, they're really focused on, well, what's going to solve this problem versus do I understand more about this problem? And so that's one way to start to think about how are we framing the problem appropriately? And sometimes it's the problem framing the problem itself is what we want to do. You could think about, um, like a simple object, like a bicycle. Um, you know, the bicycle is blue. Um, the bicycle is, is specialized. There are frames of looking at a bicycle. I could look at it and be like, oh, I could look at it through one frame as a color. And it's like, what color is the bike? It's blue. And think about it from the aesthetic version. Uh, I could look at another frame and be like, what type of bike is it? Well, it's a road bike. Um, so that's a different. And then another frame would be, how is the bike often used? Uh, commuter bike? Exercise bike, you know, race bike, that kind of thing. Um, there are different frames to look at the same thing as a bicycle. I'm still looking at a bike, but I'm looking at it through different lenses. One through an aesthetic lens, yeah. uh, one through more of an exercise uses lens, et cetera. Um, one through a categorical lens, like how am I categorizing this bicycle? And so that's kind of how you can start to think and frame things uh, when you're looking at a scenario. Yeah. I'd love to ask you something here. So one of the things that has been when I've been coaching people recently, uh, particularly when I, if I'm coaching somebody who I don't actually work with, you know, so just a, so a listener in the audience, sometimes I, I'll do coaching sessions with people in the audience, friends, whatever. A piece of advice I was giving someone recently was if they could only change one sort of set of practices in their teams would be to move from sort of big bang heavyweight process, especially around research mm. to kind of just lightweight, ongoing, continuous. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious, A, do you agree with that? And B, if you do, what do you see as the things that really get in the way of that? Because I find that to be a lot of people see it, but they're having a hard time getting there. I say mostly, yes. I, I think there are scenarios where, you know, you really just need to stop and do some heavy research. Um, maybe you just don't know enough. Um, I, I would say that those are probably less and less these days, but there are definitely scenarios where you just need to kind of like, all right, we're going to roll up our sleeves and spend the next couple of months digging into this because we just don't know enough. Um, that may mean you have a series of small, lighter weight things as well um, because the that learning velocity is what you're really looking for here. Um, but it may take you three, five, six months sometimes to get an appropriate answer for a question, whether that be a question on the user side or on technology side. Um, you know, example that we're working on, we have some technology we're working on from a machine learning perspective that it's not like we could do these lightweight things and learn something in a week. We actually need a lot more time to to let that happen because we just mm-hmm. need to acquire the amount of data, uh, process it, et cetera. It's going to take months to, to get there. Um, it's not going to be like, oh yeah, it's one or two weeks of research and we're done. No. Uh, uh, so I think there's 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 definite scenarios, but I, I tend to be on the side of, yeah, let's be a little more lightweight in what we're trying to do, because I think it goes back to that learning velocity. How quickly can we learn if we're right, wrong and course correct, uh, especially in software, because we can change things relatively quickly. Um, it's, you know, these days we can change you can change stuff within you know a couple of weeks like oh we've built this feature this way actually it's the wrong feature doesn't solve the problem let's move and change it uh, go in another, another different direction um you know the example i gave you with the operator interface like yeah we were throwing up some numbers but the numbers weren't quite doing it so the visual actually helped a lot better um you know simple simple solution different solution but our one of the original solutions didn't solve the problem we had to go go think it again so um mm, yeah yeah does that does that help it does. It does. As I'm re- I was reading the book and everybody, if you're interested in learning more about how to do product research, I highly recommend going and getting your hands on this. It's a, it's a short book, but it really, it, it, it's 
there's no fluff. Let's put it that way. It just gets right into it, which I, I thoroughly appreciate as somebody who reads a lot of books. Um, one of the things that I really noticed, and I'm actually going to reference the page number here. Wow. I think it's page 89 um, because it stood out to me that much. There's a chart you have there where you basically help people figure out one of, one of the things that I think is most difficult, which is basically which tool do I use when? 76, I think, thing. the actual book. Okay, so, this, so it's actually changed. But the, the question here, C. Todd, is you know, there's so many tools at our disposal. How do we decide which tool to use yeah. when? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does ultimately goes back to like, what is it that you're trying to answer, right? Making, and this is that was the big thing for this particular chapter was you don't want to go to um, an evaluative research technique like a usability test, like, can somebody, you know, complete this flow and, you know, let's see, complete to check out of the shopping cart, right? You don't want to do that when you're still trying to understand what their buying behaviors and attitudes are. Uh, so putting somebody, putting a, a shopping cart design concept and seeing how they navigate your, your, your shopping cart isn't going to tell you attitudes and behaviors. It might tell you a little bit if you're able to ask them a couple of questions. It's not going to give you the, the right data you need. So matching the, the method of your research with what you're trying to answer. And this gets to probably the, the research question. What the heck is a research question? How is it different than just an interview question? Um, that's probably, you know, you need to think about those, those methods of, all right, uh, it's just like building a house. You're not going to, you know, um, necessarily get two pieces of wood stuck together with a saw. You're going to separate one piece into two that way, right? Make sure you use the right tools yep. for the right thing. Um, so, and sometimes I think there's been a reliance of when you only have a hammer, right? Everything looks like a nail. Oftentimes some people mm -hmm. just be like, oh, well, let's design a prototype and put it in front of our customers. Like it's really good to do that, but it's not the only thing we should be doing, right? We should be looking at a lot of different things. And one of the, you should be looking at your, your qualitative data. You should be looking at your quantitative data. Uh, you should be looking at your market data. You should look at all of those different things because as a product leader, you can't ignore any of them, right? You might have a focus in one, one area or the other, but you can't ignore them. You have to bring them all together. And that's a thing we were trying to do with the book. Um, but when it goes back to like, how do I know which one to do? Like that table we create is like, all right, if we are looking for attitudes and behavior, qualitative type of research, right? Generative user research, you want to be looking at like dairy studies, interviews, other things like that to try and explore this. Now, we didn't want to make the book a compendium of methods because when we started down this path, we're like, this is going to be an encyclopedia that's like 900 pages mm -hmm. long. Hence the, the sort of ev evolution into like, these are some rules to guide you um and mm -hmm. think about things uh so but you know if you want to look at more qualitative things like what pathways does um a customer navigate through your application to get to a certain point like you may want to look at your 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 qualitative data, whether you use pendo or amplitude or google Analytics or whatever you know, heap any of your favorite analytics packages that can help start to tell you what the journey is through that from a product usage perspective but what you don't know is where were they before they came into your product? What did they do after they left your product? Uh, what drove them to come into your product that day? Uh, was it a notification or a trigger or was it some other external factor? Um, that's where some of your qualitative data can help you. Um, do you need to find out like, um, you know, what, is there a hierarchy around things? Like, are you looking for a particular behavior? So a lot of it is, you know, abstracting it back, goes back to like, what are you looking to try and answer? Making sure you're matching the type of, of data, qualitative or quantitative, probably some mix of both, uh, with the the what you're, that matches up to the research question you're trying to answer. And that research question could be a lot of different things. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, talk to me a little bit. So, in terms of selecting methods, a lot of the listeners I have heard from are at the earlier stages of a product, right? And so, I'm curious, how do some of these tools, like how do, does the thinking need to shift if somebody is, you know, really early stage, like maybe it's a brand new product in a startup that doesn't have product market fit yet? Yeah. You know, that is a very different world than when you're optimizing and scaling a thing that is fully locked into a market. Yeah. Yeah. You're still, you're still in discovery mode in a sense. Right. And so a lot of it is going to be more, much more qualitative type of research than because one, you probably don't have a lot of customers you know, tracking through your products. So you can just say, Oh yeah, you know, I've got X percent of my customers, you know, doing this and yeah, that. You, don't have thing. A lot of analytics you, you, you might have 10, 10 customers. So that like, you know, 10% means only five or uh, uh, one person uh, doing this. So um, you're probably much more on the, on the, qualitative side of, of things. So you like more generative user research, ethnographic studies, more um, maybe even descriptive users are taking that like, all right, because generative research might be like, what questions do we need to answer? Um, descriptive mm. research says, we know what the question is. We just need to fill out 
what actually what what's going on here. We need to we need to be more descriptive of, of the scenario. Um, so you're looking probably at, at different types of research questions there than if you're in like I'm you know I'm Dropbox. I just need to work on optimizing for uh, yeah. you know this particular um, problem around file sharing, for example, or file editing, that kind of thing. Um, and that's where you might want to look at usage patterns and diagnostics analysis and, and things like that. And then you can start to, you know, if you have lots of data, you can get predictive. Um, but that's a whole mm-hmm. other yeah. whole ball of wax. But yeah, that, that sort of Indeed. that table in the book tries to map out like here's stage one, here's stage two, here's stage three. And we kind of give you some very, you know, finger stick guidelines around, well, this is the type of things you probably want to understand. Here are a couple suggested approaches and a couple of detailed methods. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the questions that's come up, you know, everybody in product, we all, we all deal with, uh, you know, everyone's favorite word stakeholder. Um, and one of the, one of the things that occurs to me and I've seen is that there's a trap we can fall into when we start to adopt some of these methods, which is, you know, the team might be really doing a great job running way ahead, like getting into the research, understanding what is going on, et cetera. And there, it seems to me there's a real risk of, if you don't bring those stakeholders along for the ride, mm-hmm. th- it's not going to go well at the other end, yep. right? Like you're going to come out the other end with a very different conclusion. That's going to be jarring. It's probably not gonna, It's probably going to get shot down. Um, so how do, how do, how do teams do that? How do we, how do we bring all these other folks who are not actually necessarily in the room and <laughs> on the ride? How do we bring them along for the ride so that they're yeah. you know, bought into what happens at the other There's end? There's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, uh, one of the things we talked about in the design sprint book way back when was that bringing in um, executives or other stakeholders at key parts. So maybe they can't be there for the whole, uh, whole design sprint, but bring them in at the initial um, kickoff, bring them in when you're doing an assumption storming exercise to understand like, what are the key questions and assumptions we have, you know, get there, get, make sure that they're part of it. Um, and then we would bring them in again, like, Hey, these are the key problems that we think we're going to solve. Or these are the, these are the, the prototypes we're looking to build. They're just sketches right now, but here's how they relate to the initial assumptions and things we had previously. So bring them in again and be like, Oh yeah, I see where you're going. And then bring them, uh, once you've done all the interviews from at the end of a design sprint, you're doing your debrief, bring them in and say, Hey, look, we're going to do a debrief. We can watch some videos. We can talk about some of these things and they, you include them in for small parts, like maybe half hour, you know, each time. So they're not spending the entire 40 hour week, but they've spent maybe an hour and a half to two hours over the whole week um, with the team along the way. That's super helpful. The other thing is try to bring, mm-hmm. bring the scenario to them. Um, one of my favorite books is the, the Chip and Dan Heath book switch. And in that mm-hmm. book, I don't know if you've read it, but the story that they tell about, um, trying to get organizational change around, uh, the ordering system and inventory and procurement, sorry, it was procurement. And they found that, uh, I think it was a, maybe it was Ford. One of the auto companies had a bunch of different gloves that they were buying, uh, rubber gloves, all different types of gloves. And it turned out there was like a hundred or, or 200 different types of gloves that they were ordering across their, 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 um, company. And that alone was just causing all sorts of procurement issues. Um, so what they did is they said, get me one of each pair. And they brought the box of one of each pair of, like, I think it was like 200, but it was a lot of, mm. and they brought, and they just dumped it out on the conference table and said, look, this is a problem. So they brought the problem to the team and mm-hmm. said, look, mm-hmm. you know, so it's, this is a way to go beyond just a, a graph. I mean, think about how empower and impactful mm-hmm. that is versus here's a chart that shows the number of gloves we have, right? Versus I'm, I'm looking at a pile of a hundred gloves that are on this conference room table right now. Uh, mm-hmm. Very, very different impactful, but it's a way of bringing the problem to the stakeholders so that they can see what's going mm-hmm. on with the research. Right. So um, that was a great example. I think of, of uh, physical things on top of their desk and other you know, videos is obviously a good thing. I'm sure there's other AR VR types of ways to say, Hey, look, let me play you what it's like to be this person for a day. And let me play you like five minute snippets of this or throw on some AR and see what it's like to try and navigate their life. Uh, or you got to walk around the hospital here, try to walk around the hospital with this, these impediments. How do you do it? Right. So bringing that mm, beyond like just that. the data, bringing the, some level of emotion to it in some way is really helpful by if you can't bring them into it, uh, bring some element of it to them. And that's how that's uh, mm. I say like a very high level, but that's how you have to try and do it in either direction. No, I like that. I like that because you know often 
I actually appreciate that more, slightly more abstract answer because that is like kind of the principle that you can lean on, right? And you can, you know, the details are, of every situation are different, but if you understand that's the principle, it's okay, don't bring them to the problem, bring the problem to them, help them, you know, see it and understand it. That, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I want to shift gears here and close out with some rapid fire questions. They are short questions. Your answers don't have to be. They, they're just okay. kind of fun starting points. So uh, first one is, what is a quote that's important to you? Or saying, you know, something you you kind of come back to often. And what about it speaks to you? Oh wow, so many, so many things here. Um, I'm trying to like, which one do I pick? <laughs> I, I think probably the thing that speaks to me the most, and I don't know if this can be attributed to anybody in particular, but it's like be curious, right? I think that that mm. just is such a a helpful guide in career and life um, about being curious. Um, you know, they, what is it? There's never a stupid question or something like that. Um, that's the thing to me is like, you got to ask questions. You just have to ask questions. And um, because with that, you just learn so much, regardless of who you are, where you are and being humble about it. No stupid, no, there, no question is a stupid question. Uh, it's probably the biggest one for me um, in terms of quotes. Yeah, absolutely. One, one of the things to live by right there. So who or what has had a really big influence on how you show up? Yeah. Um, I would say, oh man, I'd say I have, I have two, probably two places I can go with that. One is very personal. Um, my grandmother um, lived till she was 97 mm -hmm. years old, probably the most positive person I've ever met in my life. Um, mm -hmm. And very fortunate to that. Uh, and she was positive till her dying day. Um, because she would say to me, you know, and she, when she was 97 years old, every day I wake up, get out of bed and put my feet on the ground is a good day. So if you, mm. as, as much as you think anybody of you listening right now, you're having a bad day, you got up, you got out of bed and you put your feet down on the ground. You're having a good day because there are many people in this world who can't do those things. So you're probably having mm. a good day, even if you might think you're having a bad day. So I think there's some level of, she had this simplistic wisdom to her, which I think, you know, now she, she passed away many years ago, but I think still affects me because it just had this certain like way of showing up and, and looking at being here today right now um, and being appreciative mm -hmm. of even a simple thing of just waking up and standing up in the morning. Um, and so that that's sort of one more personal element of how I think about has shaped how I show up. And I think another mm -hmm. one, um, is is also a little little personal but also related to to work in that my dad was a diy like he's a diy guy through and through electrical trained electrical engineer but he's the type of person who's like ah we could do this better like i can't tell how many times yeah. like why yeah. do they do why do they design it this way this doesn't make any sense they should totally do this better um and you know taught me how to like you know fix a car when i was a kid and all these things that like and you know you've got a manual and a handful of tools and you're like all right we're not a mechanic shop but we're gonna figure out how to fix this car uh, that kind of trying to problem solve as a kid growing up definitely helps with the, and I didn't realize it until I actually got to business school. And that's probably the other more mm. where it like further took shape was that critical thinking in, in business school and design school that helps you think about problems in a different way and how do you solve them? Um, so those sort of three things come together, I think helps shape how I think about things and think about problems and, and trying to be a problem solver. And even more so, even mm. better than being a problem solver, can I prevent the problem from happening in the first place? Yeah. So getting ready for this interview, I, I listened to a number of other things. Obviously, I've read some of your books and it was really clear to me that you, know, you your mind, whether by nature or by training or by both, uh, seems to bring together and fuse a few different modes of thinking into an interesting cocktail of like you, there's a sort of very uh, there's a very human element of it. And then there's also a very sort of critical design thinking element to it. And then there's also a little bit of like that sort of very analytical uh, engineering element to it where you're, you know, you're not trying to just understand the problem. You're like, cool, what's the root cause and how do I, how do I weed that sucker out? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think it's ever been, been phrased to me that way. So thank you. That's uh, that's very illuminating to hear. Hopefully that resonates with it, you and it, it feel like it really does. I think it, it does. Uh, yeah. And it's very, it's an honor to hear that. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, it's funny. I, I was just, uh, this morning I happened to be, uh, scrolling through Twitter and I saw you had retweeted something about, and somebody else had tweeted about, you know, Hey, you can be 
successful without uh, being an entrepreneur, making millions of dollars, uh, writing the most cutting edge machine learning, co- like whatever, all these lists of these various, you know, shiny things in the current culture. And I was curious, you know, when you think about that today for you, like where you are today, your life, what does success look like for you now at this stage? Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's around, um, am I helpful and impactful? Am I able to help somebody big or small? Like the, the fact, like I consider it successful because today I was able to break your brain in a very small way around questions. Yeah. I was able to break your brain and, and help you think differently about questions. That success, I made an impact on somebody's world. Hopefully I've made, you know, your life a little bit better. So the next time you think about questions or, or framing a problem, you might remember this conversation and, and it might, you might just might be like infinitely better at being a good problem framer. And if that mm. is true, I'm successful. Like that is so cool to me. Like that is to me the thing that I'll maybe also help partly while I, how I show up is I, I hope I want to be helpful in any way I can. And if it's helpful in a small way or a big way, I don't care. It, to me, it's, it's an equal amount of joy I will feel if I help you in a very tiny way or I help you in a really big way. Mm. So yeah. success to me That's is how, how can I help? Yeah, no, I love that. This is uh, going to probably come across as a complete tangent, but I have a deep interest in um, Eastern philosophies, especially Buddhist philosophies. And there's been, I've been doing, having a lot of conversations exploring the overlap of those ideas and how they integrate with a lot of the more Western ideas that we've spent our, our days inside of around business, capitalism, so on and so forth. And I think when you start to look from the place that you are standing right now, you start to see something that is very unpopular right now or out of vogue, which um, it's very, very popular right now to kind of bash on capitalism and, and you know, capitalist patriarchal society, et cetera, et cetera. And there's good reasons for those criticisms, for sure. Um, but I think there also there's another view that is often missed that is what I see when I look from the place you're articulating right now, which is that um, at its best, and I emphasize that <laughs> because there is a worst, but at its best, the things that we're talking about here, whether it's product or business in general, are fundamentally generous acts. Mm. And I think that's something that's for some reason it's just overlooked and kind of missed, but it's something that I am, I don't know, I'm, I'm hearing in what you're saying. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that's when I look back at leaders I've followed or people who've mentored me in my life or, or managers I've had that the ones who have been more generous are the ones that I look back and like, I learned a lot from them. They helped me like they weren't a jerk or an asshole or, or authoritarian, um, I, I, I have an employee who reports to me. I think he's, he's got a background in thinking that authoritarianism is like, is what leadership means. And, um, mm. and I'm not an authoritarian leader. I think for him, it's like, maybe I'm breaking his brain a little bit to use your phrase. Um, but also showing them like, look, it's not about me dictating what you, what to do. It's about me helping you be a better you. And I think for him, it's a little like, huh. Uh, and I, I just try to emulate that as like, cause the people who've influenced me have been the ones who are probably the most generous with their time and energy because they've been, they've invested something in me. So I need to, I should turn around and do the same because that makes us all better. Yeah, for sure. Quick aside. Have you ever read the book? Um, turn the ship around? No. Should I? I think you'd like okay. it. I think you'd really like it because there, it, it articulates kind of a, a really different way of looking at leadership where it's about, our job as leaders is basically to create more leaders mm-hmm. uh, and to make everybody the leader that the best leader they can be and help them work to their natural best. And then to help all of us get to where we're trying to go together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like that. I think you really, really like that. It's a cool story. Yeah, cool. Um, uh, okay. So then a couple more quick ones here is, you know, if you think about what is a small change you've made in recent memory, and that could be a week, it could be six months, whatever. But what's a small change you've made in recent memory that's had an outsized impact for you? Uh, what we talked about earlier, uh, the desk, right? So even before I got this desk, and I still have to put the standing desk together, I moved the desk I had to a different room. So uh, this is sort of like my, was previously only my wife's office, but, um, and I had it in another, another area of the house. Um, this was just the fact of moving this here, and then we put a sofa somewhere. Like We just made some subtle rearrangements to the house by putting this desk here and then a sofa over there huge, huge impact in just the, like the feng shui, the flow of the house, the me feeling like, Oh, I'm not so cramped in, in this house. Oh, also there's, um, 
There's a light here you see on the ceiling. Uh, there used to be a ceiling mm -hmm. fan there. So that was dropped by about another 18 inches. So this room felt a lot smaller. So by removing the ceiling fan, moving the desk in here, like already, and there's more, there's more sunlight as you see in the, uh, from the window, really outsized impact. And just my, my overall feeling of this, you know, work from home all the time ness has been a challenge uh, because I mentioned earlier, my desk constraints, and everything. that alone has been a big help. I can only imagine once I get the standing desk, that'll be, you know, uh, even better. So very small change, yeah, but really a big impact. <laughs> hundred percent. Okay. This is a bit of a random one, but what thing do you know best? I, I, it's a hard, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just, I don't know if I know anything best. Um, that's the thing for me. That's a hard question to answer. I'm like, there's probably somebody out there who's better than me at this. Um, uh, and maybe it's just a, an, in, an internal narration I have the, uh, in my I'm life. I'm not asking what you know better than other people. Um, I'm asking what you know, what is the thing you know the best for yourself? Like, of all the things you know, what do you feel like you are? You really have a handle on? Um, probably. I know it's totally hard. Probably <laughs> trying to dr drive to clarity, and uh, hence the question thing, right? Um, uh, driving to clarity is something that I, I think I I do well and know pretty well. Um, when I facilitate groups, either virtually or previously in, in the room, um, and, and I can try to just reflect back on comments i've had where people have said to me things like after a, whether it be uh you know a, something i've done as a consultant engagement uh, or something i've done with a team they're like wow i just really it makes sense everything makes sense now or like that was the best mm. damn meeting i've had in my 30 something year career or um holy mm. crap this the, this provides so much clarity we know what we're going to do next and or like uh, one thing for a client once and then we come back later like yeah we had like our best our best meeting we had in 20 years after I helped them think through what that meeting was looking like. So things like that are probably hmm. like, I don't know, maybe that's the the thing I can, I know better, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure there's somebody else who's, who's even better at it than I am. Sure. Sure. Awesome. So uh, first of all, C Todd, th thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for spending time with me and for the work you're doing. I really appreciate it and your openness in this conversation. Um, but just in closing out, what do you want to leave the listener with? Well, firstly, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I mean, it's always an honor to be be invited on any podcast, uh, let alone this one. And um, I, I really appreciate the thought that you put into into this. And, and clearly, like your your questions, you you came prepared, even though I know we went off script. Uh, you came prepared, and that was super cool. Um, things that I want to leave listeners with, um, I would challenge every product person, product leader, to think about how they're framing things, how they're framing their questions, how they are asking questions of their, their colleagues and how they're asking questions of themselves. Um, I know it's a, maybe it's a cop out by saying, but that self-reflection and thinking about how, even if I just can change how I ask this question, right? Even if I can just make the change from a slightly closed ended question to a slightly more open ended question or vice versa. If you can reflect on that just a little bit before you have your next meeting or next conversation, um, how might that help you be a little bit this much better? Awesome. See, Todd, thanks so much for being here and uh, really, really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on iTunes. That helps us reach way more people and build this community up. For show notes, links to the resources and everything else we discussed, please go to enliven.fm. Feel free to reach out with questions, feedback, or just to say hello by emailing connect at enliven.fm. Be sure to subscribe and until next time, my friends, leave them better than you found them. We'll see you soon.